Uh, next up is uh, our own cardiac anesthesiologist, Dr. Karambir Singh, who's going to be talking to us about uh, anesthetic considerations for LVAD. All right, fantastic. Uh, so Friday night, I got the chance to meet some of you guys, and um, I asked the question, what do you guys want to know about LVADs? And the, the, what people really uh, said was that we want something practical. We don't want you to just talk for 15 minutes, and then we have nothing to take home. So hopefully this, is, uh, this will be something practical. Okay, so indications for LVAD are basically it's patients who have failed medical therapy and uh, are either ineligible for transplant um, uh, or, or, or waiting for transplant. So this is either a bridge for transplantation or destination therapy. Now the outcomes uh, over the past 30 years have been improving. Either it's a result of improved devices or improved management of these patients. So as you can see uh, on these graphs, the more recent studies are showing dramatic improvement, so much to the point that, that it's not quite close to transplantation, but given the limitation in the number of organs, this provides quite an quite a interesting opportunity um, for patients. Not only is survivability increasing, but also quality of life. Uh, there's an improvement in the six-minute walk. There's an improvement in, or a decrease in their New York heart classifications from three to four to one to two uh, over a three-month, uh, six-month period. But there's also an improvement in their Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaires, which, which correlate functional capacity and quality of life. So how are you dealing with, with your heart failure? And it seems that the scores uh, improve. So. So as, as Tom mentioned, these patients can do almost anything but get into the water. Um, just to make this uh, a very concise presentation, I'm gonna break it up into pre-bypass concerns and post-bypass concerns. And in the pre-bypass concerns, you're really concerned with right ventricular function, you're concerned with aortic insufficiency, tricuspid insufficiency, the presence of intracardiac shunts, and whether there's a left atrial or left ventricular thrombus present. So this is a patient uh, with dilated uh, right, ventri uh, right ventricle. And in order to assess um, the function, there's a number of ways. One is simply looking at the wall of the ventricle to see if it's moving. But slightly more uh, complicated ways are to look at fractional area of change, which is basically measuring out the area and end systole uh, and end diastole. Uh, diastole. Uh, and then getting, uh, uh, subtracting the two and getting the, uh, uh, and dividing it by the end diastolic area to get fractional area of change. However, the problem is, is that the right ventricle is not a cylinder. It's not, it's very difficult to appreciate in two dimension. So where is the left ventricle? It's pretty easy to do fractional area of change. The right ventricle basically, this is the left ventricle, surrounds it. So it's sort of a C-shaped structure. Uh, so that's quite difficult to, really get an accurate estimate with fractional area of change. The next technique is tricuspid annular uh, systolic plane excursion, where you basically look at the movement of the tricuspid valve. In essence, if it moves quite a fair bit, uh, the right ventricular function is normal. If it doesn't move very much at all, uh, it's abnormal. And then you can use tissue Doppler uh, to look at the tricuspid annular plane systolic velocity. If it's greater than 10 centimeters per second, if you look at that S wave there, if it's greater than 10, uh, um, 10 centimeters per second, it's somewhat normal. If it's less than, it's abnormal. And then you can also, given time, you can uh, do complex 3D modeling to look at LV, uh, sorry, RV volumes. So the next step is to look for the presence of aortic insufficiency. Uh, this is obviously a patient, this is the mid-esophageal aortic valve long axis view, uh, in a patient with very mild aortic insufficiency. But the, the, the problem with patients with heart failure is they have significantly low diastolic uh, pressures. So what um, you might think of, uh, you might underestimate the degree of insufficiency in these patients. So that's something to really watch out for. So this is a patient uh, with obviously a much greater degree of aortic insufficiency. There's a, a very wide jet that uh, goes deep into the ventricle. This is a patient, if he was being evaluated for an ALVAD would also need an additional procedure uh, to fix that problem. 
Uh, another thing you have to look at is the presence of tricuspid insufficiency. The mechanism for tricuspid insufficiency in these patients is essentially uh, annular dilation. The heart gets bigger, you uh, have an incompetent tricuspid valve. And so at what point do you need to um, take care of this, uh, this problem? And I think anything more than moderate tricuspid insufficiency, you, you definitely uh, need to probably uh, repair that. Uh, and whether it's, uh, it's with an annual plasty ring or just a suture, uh, it definitely needs to be addressed because uh, it'll be very difficult uh, to separate from cardiopulmonary bypass if, uh, if you basically don't have uh, forward flow filling the left ventricle. The other thing that's interesting uh, to look at is also the presence of uh, intraatrial uh, shunts or any sort of intracardiac shunts. And the reason for that is this is a patient who has a uh, left to right shunt, probably a PFO, and after the LVAD uh, is placed, you're, you have a reduction in left atrial pressures. With that reduction, you'll change to, from a left to right shunt, uh, sorry, ch yeah, change from a left to right shunt to a right to left shunt and have subsequent hypoxemia. So again, something to look at, something to watch out for. If it's present, something to root. It's, it's a pretty easy fix. Uh, so it's something to take care of prior to that. So this two views, one is a patient with a, uh, uh, intraatrial uh, thrombus in the uh, atrial appendage, and the other one is with an LV thrombus. Again, th with, um, with patients who are either in AFib or patients who have poor contractility, there's a low flow state. Low flow states uh, predisposed to the formation of clots. So this is a little bit uh, sort of di uh, model of the, uh, of the LVAD, and what you have here on the chest x-ray is the inflow cannula attached to the impeller, and then there's an outflow graft which attaches to the ascending aorta. From the impeller, there's a, there's a drive line which goes to this control system which not only powers it, but also looks at uh, how well the uh, LVAD is performing. So the next step is uh, the LVAD's placed. What, do you, what, do you, what are we interested in? Uh, it's uh, essentially we're looking at to make sure that deering is uh, is performed, that the cannula position uh, is correct, that the that the volume status in the left ventricle is adequate to reassess whether the degree of aortic insufficiency is worse, and again see if there's any change in in the direction of an intracardiac shunt. So here we have um, the impeller. And what we have here is a suction cannula that's attached to the end of it to de-air this system. And uh, after we've successfully de-aired here, uh, we're attaching the outflow cannula and then de-airing again. And the reason de-airing is important is because it prevents um, you know, coronary emboli, it prevents cerebral emboli, uh, so it's, it's a very key step uh, in this procedure. The next step is to look at cannula position. What you want to make sure is that the cannula is, uh, is positioned uh, in the center of the ventricle. And uh, Dr. Suarez, uh, basically when we're on pump, we look at the echo, fill the heart up while we're on pump, and he basically pokes at the, at the apex of the LV and to decide where he's going to put, uh, put, the, uh, put the inflow cannula. And it's very important. You want to make sure that it's not pointed towards the septum. Uh, and in the pre-op exam, if you have a patient with a small LV, that can cause problems and, um, uh, in, in terms of uh, making sure that the, that the cannula is in the middle and it doesn't have any suck down effects. So this is uh, basically a mid-esophageal four-chamber view. The cannula is right in the middle. This is an orthogonal view. Again, it's free from, from the walls. It's not, uh, uh, it doesn't look like there's any uh, cords or anything like that, papillary muscles or anything obstructing this, uh, this cannula. Uh, this is in 3D, again, right in the center of the, of the, of the chamber. If you put uh, continuous wave Doppler, you, you'll find a, a very low uh, uh, velocity. Uh, anything less than two is, uh, is, uh, is adequate. Generally, probably one to two is more, more like it. Uh, so this is a mid-esophageal aortic valve view on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see your infralateral wall. On the left-hand side of the screen, it's your anteroseptal wall. And you see the position of the cannula is positioned, A, very close to the wall, 
and, uh, and, and sort of angled towards the antroseptum. So probably not ideal. Again, if you look at it with continuous uh, Doppler, you'll see that there's a, there'll probably be a bit of a, of a, a gradient. So the next step is looking at LV filling, and this is something you know, we, we, we do routinely as we're, as we're, uh, as we're uh, powering up the VAD to ensure that there's enough volume, but not too much volume. The, the, the image on the left probably looks like there, it's overfilled, the LV is overfilled, so in this case you can increase the RPMs on the LVAD, and on the right uh, it was uh, slightly underfilled uh, and you can see the, the cavity size. So in, that's, in that image, probably uh, either figure out a way to get more volume to, volume to the LV or reduce LVAD flows. So this one is a very clear, uh, clear cut image. This is, a, this is a hardware device. And at the top of the screen, it, looks, uh, it shows the RPMs. And, and at that point, it's at 2,400 RPMs. You see that the cavity of the, of the left ventricle is, is very, very small. And, um, and in that case, the key is to reduce the, uh, the RPMs or, or figure out if there's, uh, there's a problem. Is there RV failure that's resulting in reduced volume delivered to the LV? So this is a patient with a significant problem. He has AI. And uh, not only is it, it it's quite significant uh, in the sense that it's going all the way towards the, uh, the inflow cannula. So it's a serious problem, and all you're really doing is, is, is creating a loop. Uh, you flow towards the ascending, your, uh, the aortic insufficiency flows back into the ventricle and you're just basically flowing in a loop. Uh, this shows the effect of, of VAD uh, flow uh, in terms of the degree of aortic insufficiency. So at 8,600 RPMs, yeah, it looks like there's a little bit of, there is some, uh, some aortic insufficiency, but if you increase the VAD flow, obviously it's going to get worse. So what do you do in, in situations where you have aortic insufficiency? Could you put a, uh, a, um, a TAVR? Do you, do you sew the valve? What do you do? And this is just a case report where they put a, uh, an occluder device at the level of the uh, aortic valve in order uh, to stop that. Uh, this is an image of a right to left shunt. You can clearly see in the left atrium there's a considerable amount of flow. The uh, Nyquist limit has been dropped to about 32 to accentuate that, uh, that effect. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the anesthetic concern, so I'm going to talk about it in two minutes. It's basically everything Jason said. That's the anesthetic concern. So uh, these patients with heart failure have uh, lower volume of uh, distribution. They have renal hepatic dysfunction. Uh, and as a result, you get an increase in plasma concentration of uh, IV anesthetics. They're generally uh, living on the right side of the Starling curve, so additional volume is generally not helpful. They have high sympathetic tone um, and respond dramatically to agents that reduce it. So uh, the other thing that's, that's very common is that the cause of death is sepsis. So be careful with your lines. Make sure it's everything's sterile. Make sure the antibiotics are important. Um, and another interesting problem with, with these patients is the, uh, is the occurrence of vasoplegia. Vasoplegia is essentially um, um, hypotension in the setting of normal cardiac, uh, cardiac function. Um, I think I'm, run, I'm close to running out of time, so I'll, I'll be very quick about this. But it occurs for 30% of the time in VADs. There's an increase in right heart failure, increase in mortality, increase in respiratory failure, increase in the length of stay. So it's very common in VADs, and very bad things happen as a result of it. Uh, this is a very nice article that predicts the, uh, the incidence of vasoplegia. And the bottom line here is that if you are very sick, you're at higher rate, you have a higher uh, likelihood of developing uh, vasoplegia. If you're starting out hypotensive, you're going to develop vasoplegia. And interestingly enough, if you have an elevated CVP, uh, you're also going to um, develop vasoplegia. Um, also, cross clamp times and pump times are, are an issue. And uh, this is uh, just basically the, uh, the, the uh, interagency registry uh, of uh, at the Intermax scores that basically uh, look at how sick patients are. So treatment st uh, strategies, uh, again, multiple vasoconstrictors, addition of glucocorticoids, which improve the response of vasoconstrictors, methylene blue, which modulates nitric oxide, hydroxy, uh, hydroxycobalamin, which also uh, uh, works in a, in a similar way, 
uh, and then novel ideas are uh, using sympathetic blockades such as alpha-2 agonists and beta, beta blockers to uh, look at, um, to block the sympathetic uh, nervous system and improve uh, response to vasoconstrictors. So my son helped me with these slides, so he wanted mentioning there, he's doing his uh, Lord of the Dance uh, impression right there. Uh, and, but, uh, but the bottom line is, so just to, to, to recap, uh, be careful at induction. These are the same patients that Jason and Gary mentioned. Um, uh, right heart failure, you know, be careful. Uh, vasoplegia, be careful, treat early. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much.